Hey friends, today is the day that we uh, deep dive some Morrison. I was really nervous to film this video. I feel like approaching or talking about a great, there's a lot of pressure with that and I didn't want to be the one to do it, but also Morrison has been such a central part of my life. Yeah, I am just a human who enjoys Morrison. I'm not like a scholar or anything. So just take that <laughs> before we begin. Also want to give a disclaimer that it is currently really rainy and stormy in New York City. So if you hear the rain pattering on my AC, I am sorry. I'm hoping that the microphone is helping us out, but just in case. So my experience experience with Morrison. I read my first Morrison with very little fanfare. I remember it was like a hot August night. My room didn't have an AC in it. So I was just like smeared onto my bed trying to not move because it was just sweltering. We had one AC in our apartment and I walked to the living room. I blew up an air mattress and laid directly beneath it. And still I was uncomfortable and irritated and desperate for relief. I just wanted to fall asleep. I felt like if I could fall asleep, we'd be okay, which I did not find. I walked over to this little bookshelf that I had in my room absentmindedly pulled a book off the shelf, blew a sigh, who cares, whatever, walked back to the living room <laughs> and laid down on my slowly deflating mattress and started to read this book with the hopes that it would just lull me to sleep. That was the only thing I was looking for. And I always describe this experience of reading The Bluest Eye as one of arrest. I was shocked. I was kind of like really confused as to what was happening, not necessarily with the context, but just like my experience of reading that book. I had never felt so enraptured and so altered by a book. I always say there was like a crack, a fracture of something inside of me and then an overflow. I don't really remember the details of The Bluest Eye, but I do remember that random August night in 2014 where I was introduced to Morrison. Maya Angelou had a quote that says, it's not important what people say, but how they make you feel. And I always think about that because Morrison shifted something in me that night. So then I didn't, I didn't return to her for a bit. <laughs> Fear, probably, but I think subconsciously I was a little bit scared to approach her by myself. I didn't want to do that alone again. And I think on a deeper level, I was just waiting for community, which takes us over to my experience on Bookstagram. So Bookstagram was a really cool place to be during the pandemic when everything was sort of up in flames. This was a space where there was so much engagement and so much community, particularly with people who were like nowhere near you, but became so close to me. There was a wonderful Bookstagrammer who had organized a buddy read of Morrison's novel, Song of Solomon. I hadn't really heard about this book. I didn't really know what to walk into, but I was just so, so grateful that we would be reading this book with one another. And so, yeah, so then we read Song of Solomon. That was my second Morrison. We sliced this book apart. We held each other's hands metaphorically via Zoom <laughs> as we were trying to make sense of the more difficult bits of this book. We're just in awe of what she was managing to do in this book. It's one of the most cinematic books I've ever read. And it, it, it's just the sense of making your way through great art and community that made this feel really special. From that experience, I learned two things. One, Morrison in community is the best way to Morrison. And two, truly the first time you're reading a Morrison, you're just getting a lay of the land. And I've said this many, 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 many times, Morrison does not just suggest a reread. She absolutely demands it. So I did little Googles to find out some information about Morrison so that I could share it with y'all. <laughs> but Mama Morrison was actually born Chloe Woofer. She was born in Lorraine, Ohio in 1931. She became Catholic, chose the name Named Anthony, which then got shortened to Tony. Ergo, our Tony. She was on the high school debate team, which absolutely checks out. Have y'all seen interviews with her? She is so quick on her feet and it's so moving to watch her just speak. But yeah, she was on a high school debate team. She was on the yearbook staff. She was in the drama club. She talks a lot about wanting to have been a dancer and she has background in theater, which also really makes sense. She went to Howard. She did her graduate studies at Cornell then went back to Howard where she met un tal Harold Morrison. They met, they got along and they got married. This marriage, however, did not last long. Good old Harold went back to Jamaica and Miss Tony came back to the Midwest pregnant and with a toddler. Something that I think is really curious about Morrison is that we never really hear about her personal life. And I think it's really fascinating that her personal history is not something that we sort of hold alongside our knowledge of her art. I think I just have been in my reading really interested in how humans who are mothers navigate being artists and doing this really demanding job of being a mother. I'm super interested in how women sort of navigate 
centering artistry and art in their lives, but also centering their children and, and being mothers. So I thought it was really curious that we don't really hear much about her being a mother and her divorce, not in the same way that I might know about a different writers. Also be it's like a product of its time. I think now this conversation has really started to surface and it's been a loud sort of space on a stage. And maybe that just wasn't the case before. Maybe she was just trying to assert the fact that that did not define who she was, that she was so much more. But yeah, anyway, Miss Morrison famously said, one person can't raise a child, neither can two. It takes a village. So I just thought that was a really interesting through line back into the types of books that I have been really curious about as of late. Another thing is that a lot of the times when I see people talk about Morrison's books, they always really like preface it and lay down a lot of caution about how difficult her books are. I feel like I always hear people describing them as books that are heavy with trauma and that always rubs me the wrong way. I think to center the trauma that these characters experience is really like a disservice to her work. It's a flattening of it. I think when you are living a racialized experience, there are certain things that are tethered to that. But Morrison's writing is so full of humor and it's so full of life and it's so full of humanity. Her work is archival and it's portraiture and there are difficult things that are experienced by the characters, but it's also animated and lively and funny and full. As I've made my way through a couple of Morrison's books, I've noticed that she sort of stalks this question of love, how love shows up, the extremes of love, what happens when there's an absence of it. She's looking at how love can be all consuming, how love can distort, how it can leave you bereft. We see this exploration through what happens when there's an absence of a mother figure or mother love, what happens when there's someone in a community that you hold despite their eccentricities. She explores love in all of these upside down ways and it's always done with the most textured and alive dialogue. I think I always forget how tall and like tactile the dialogue is. I can always really hear it and it's always just so full of resonance. So I should say this video started because last year I read a book by Joanna Biggs called A Life of One's Own, Nine Women Writers Begin Again. And it looked at several different writers, how they sort of embarked upon a new chapter when the thing that society has sort of conditioned us to achieve falls away. This book looks at several different writers and something that I wanted to sort of work on in 2024 was learning more about the writers that I really revere and having like a more textual understanding of them. And so Morrison is one of those writers. She has a wonderful essay on Morrison. I've just been pairing each essay about a writer with a book and then sort of doing a little deep dive. When discussing how vast and experimental Morrison's work can be, and Biggs was talking about Beloved in particular, she says, so this was the shape of one literary critical argument I could mount. The sort of thing I could lean on in conversation with people who thought Morrison was wise and old timey and lyrical instead of daring and contemporary and brutal. She also, well, she She's talking about Beloved. Beloved was what women's novels could, should, ought to be, and because of Morrison, are. And I really like how she sort of declares Morrison like one of the pioneers in how the novel can be experimental and play with form and sort of explore the wide things that they typically explore. I personally have only read five Morrisons and I've only reread one of her books. And so I feel like I do have this undertaking. I would love to read through her whole catalog, but I also recognize that I must reread her books in order to have a true understanding of what she's doing in them. So my journey with Morrison is at its very beginning, I would say, even though I have read five of them. I'm just gonna quickly chat about them even though I'm at the beginning. Most of my Morrison are all these like vintage covers, but I have decided that I wanna try to build a Morrison collection. I found this edition of The Bluest Eye, which I adore. The only thing is that like I went to go open it and then I guess it's so old that the cover just like snapped off. <laughs> so I had to tape it with like packing tape, but that's okay. This one is just like, for show on my little Morrison shrine. I have this edition of Jazz. I think the art on it is really beautiful. But yeah, we'll start off with The Bluest Eye. Morrison famously said of The Bluest Eye that there was a book that she wanted to read and it didn't exist yet, so she wrote it. This is a book about an 11 year old called Pekula Breedlove who loves Shirley Temple and has a notion inscribed in herself that to be white was to be beautiful. She dreamt of having blue eyes. One day while washing dishes, her father returns to the home and sexually assaults her. Morrison often writes about the question that underpin her novels. And in this one, she was curious as to how children come to believe certain things, how those ideas are nurtured, not just by the mainstream, but also by members of one's own 
own community, even if those ideas go against the community themselves. This book explores what Hilton Als calls racial malaise, how people who live outside of this very circumscribed idea of beauty mutilate and harm themselves in order to approximate that ideal. Morrison started writing this book when she was 35 years old and it was published when she was 39. She says, I never wanted to grow up to be a writer. I just wanted to grow up to be an adult. When she did publish this novel, she never led with the fact that she was a writer. It actually wasn't until she published her third novel, Song of Solomon, that she actually was like, okay, maybe I am a writer. Morrison, before she started writing, was an editor at Knopf. She was an editor of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. And in her work as an editor, Morrison was almost exclusively interested in elevating and centering black stories and black voices. She most notably worked with Gail Jones, Tony Cade Bambara. She edited poems by Lucille Clifton and Henry Dumas. She worked on the autobiography of Angela Davis. Tony and Angela were like BFFs. <laughs> and then in 1974, she edited the pretty popular Black Book. For her second novel, Morrison was sort of hounded with the question of addressing the problem of being a Negro writer. In response to this, Morrison said that her only option was fidelity to my own sensibility. Enter Sula. Sula is actually the only Morrison book that I have read twice. I'm about to reread it for a third time. But in this book, we have a story about two women, Nell and Sula, who live up at the bottom. Nell is a conformed woman. She is what we would think of as like a pillar of a community. She has stayed obediently within the bounds of expectation. But Sula, on the other hand, has acquired a habit of freedom, as Big says, which has been identified as being destructive to the community. Sula pushes against conformity. She skirts around the pressures to settle down, to have children and a family. Instead, Sula lives out her days exploring her own thoughts and emotions, giving them full reign, feeling no obligation to please anybody unless their pleasure pleased her. I love Sula. <laughs> I love her as a character. I love everything that she stands for. I was so shocked to encounter a character like this in a book by Morrison, who I always, again, forget how contemporary and brutal she can be in her writing. I am definitely at fault of doing that. And I have said this before, and I will say it again. Nell and Sula walked so that Lenu and Lila could run. So the question that sort of undergirds this story, I think is well captured by this quote. What would you be doing or thinking if there was no gaze or hand to stop you? I began to think about just what that kind of license would have been like for us black women 40 years earlier. The image of a woman who was both envied and cautioned against came to mind. So in an interview, Morrison talks about exploring the extremes on this spectrum. In the bluest eye, she was looking at the sort of over-dependence and over-reliance on the outside world for validation and self-identification. Whereas in Sula, she was looking at the opposite. She was looking at a woman who only relied on herself, her whims, what she wanted to do, what brought her pleasure. And she was only interested in her own notion of self to make her way through the world. Morrison says that she finds both deplorable, which was where I was like, Devastated because again, Sula is one of my favorite characters and to hear her mother call her deplorable uh, broke my heart a little. I was hurt. But she says that Sula would be a free woman. There's a lot of danger in that, you know, because you don't have commitments, you don't have that connection. I think freedom ideally is being able to choose your responsibilities. Not not having any responsibilities, but being able to choose the things you want to be responsible for. Okay, so there was this New York Times article published by Sarah Blackburn in 1973 that said, Reading it, Sula, in spite of its richness and its thorough originality, one continually feels its narrowness, its refusal to brim over into the world outside of its provincial setting. <laughs> the disrespect, the gall. She continues to say, Toni Morrison is far too talented to remain only a marvelous recorder of the black side of provincial American life. If she is to maintain the large and serious audience she deserves, she is going to have to address a riskier contemporary reality than this beautiful but nevertheless distanced novel. And if she does this, it seems to me that she might easily transcend that early and unintentionally limiting classification of black woman writer and take her place among the most serious, important, and talented American novelists working now. Um. Them are fighting words. <laughs> Them are fighting words. There have been a lot of interviews that have made this claim of Morrison, but we don't got to tussle for her. Morrison's got hands herself. She is, after all, Morrison. But I mean, if I can say, when are you going to write about black people to a white writer, if that's a legitimate question to a white writer, then it is a legitimate question to me. I just don't think it is. The glove has to be pulled inside out. I have had reviews in the past that have accused me of not writing about white people. I remember a review of Sula in which the reviewer said, this is all well and good, but one day she, meaning me, 
will have to face up to the real responsibilities and get mature and write about the real confrontation for black people, which is white people. As though our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze. I do have a ton of favorite quotes from Sula. There are like three that I constantly think about and truly, truly deeply love. I talk about this one all the time, but it's a scene where Sula is talking to her grandma and her grandma sort of says, when are you gonna have a kid? And Sula's just like, I'm not trying to make someone else. I'm trying to make myself. I really like that. There's also just in terms of like her writing, like here she says, she felt new, soft and new. It had been the longest time since she had had a rib scraping laugh. She had forgotten how deep and down it could be. So different from the miscellaneous giggles and smiles she had learned to be content with all these past few years. Just so good. <laughs> There's also a part where she's talking about someone's absence and how ornate that absence could be. I just constantly feel gratitude that we live in a world where these exist. So the next book we have is Song of Solomon. This was a book that Morrison wrote after the passing of her father. It was also the book where after its success, she finally started to call herself a writer. Of this book, she says that all of her life, she had heard about a time where black people could fly. She says, lie at will, you know, like a bird. And as an adult, she says that she read a ton of slave narratives. One question that was constantly asked was, did you know anyone who could fly? And she says that everyone said yes, that either they had saw someone who had flown or had a relative who knew someone who had flown. And the situation around it was kind of always the same. Someone got fed up and ran to the field and whirled and whirled and whirled and then just flew, flew back to Africa. And she says that this book started with that, not as a metaphor, but as a truth. And so Song of Solomon is this really cinematic Bildens Roman that follows Milkman as he does this like reverse migration to find out about his roots. There are themes about how we name things, the weight that they hold, birth, and death and rebirth and it's filled with tangled taboo themes. I think this was my this was my second Morrison and this was the because again I read my first Morrison when I was very young and I just remember having a really effusive emotional reaction to it. But this was the first time I realized how skilled she is at dialogue. This book was also when I realized how interested she is in theatrics. Also in sort of like magical realism, she had this really lovely relationship or mentorship with Gabriel Garcia Marquez who, as we all know, is a, a big magical realism guy. And as you start to read Morrison's stories, there's always this element of like a gothic, ghostly haunting. But there are also just some pieces that feel very magical realism E. This was sort of like my real introduction, I think, to the breadth of Morrison, how daring she is in her novels. There's a very controversial piece of this where, again, I'm so grateful I read in community because I did not know how to feel about it. <laughs> and I think it's one that has to be metabolized in community because it's so interesting and you understand, like you kind of understand, but also like morally, we can't be doing stuff like that. <laughs> so yeah, this was just like a fantastic story. There are a couple of there are a couple of quotes from Song of Solomon that I really like. Perhaps that's what all human relationships boil down to. Would you save my life or would you take it? There's also the quintessential, you wanna fly, you gotta give up the shit that weighs you down. And then there's a good one. She was the third beer, not the first, which the throat receives with almost tearful gratitude, nor the second that confirms and extends the pleasure of the first, but the third, the one you drink because it's there, because it can't hurt, and because what difference does it make? Whenever I recommend Morrison, I always say, if you're wanting something that's super cinematic, go for Song of Solomon. If you're wanting something that's pure art though, you gotta make your way to Beloved. In the black book that she published in 1974, there was one clipping about a woman named Margaret Garner. Margaret Garner was a runaway slave who had killed one of her children in order to ensure that they did not end up enslaved. And that was sort of the inspiration for Morrison to write Beloved. She said that she couldn't stop thinking about this woman and her decision, her choice. And there's this really famous story about how Beloved came to be. Morrison was sitting near where the rocks hit the Hudson. And then she says that Beloved was suddenly there. Morrison says she walked out of the water, climbed the rocks, leaned against the gazebo, nice hat. And so Beloved is a story of this family living in 124, a house that is haunted by this baby ghost named Beloved. And this baby ghost happens to be the ghost of the daughter that Setha had killed because Setha was trying to protect her child from having to be enslaved. She sort of preferred her child to not be alive than have to live the realities and the horrors of slavery. This book to me felt like a book that was completely 
concerned with the question and power of memory, how physical it can become, and how we learn to navigate the world when those dark memories manifest as like physical roadblocks in our lives. Of Beloved, Biggs said that it's a novel searching for form. Progress towards this would have to be halting and the book would have to be sinuous. It would have to speak in different voices and different styles. Its narrative would have to be divided among the characters. It was too much for one person to carry. I love that. This book is really playful. Oh, I can't even say playful because it's just so much more skilled than that, but it's very experimental in its form. You're sort of seeing this family start to grapple with the baby ghost beloved. We're starting to see Denver build a relationship with her, Setha build a relationship with her, Baldi <laughs> build a relationship with this baby ghost. And then as the story continues, all of a sudden the voice sort of switches and there's wonderful things that are done. This book has one of the most chilling scenes that I've ever read. I It's very long, so I don't want to read it, but the scene where Baby Shugs is giving sermon in the field, I will never be okay. I will actually never be okay again. That was one of the most chilling, phenomenal scenes. And again, she's so fantastic at setting that scene and conveying it in such an arresting way way. I really do believe that this is one of the, this is like a piece of art. It's like watching all the films and enjoying all of the paintings and listening to all of the music all in one. Like everything that you could get from art, you can get from this novel. It's done so masterfully and it's one that like, I, I feel like with every book you can reread it and constantly get like new layers of understanding, but you can truly study this book and get so much out of it. It's such a full, 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 full book. So fantastic, so well written, obviously. This might be like my favorite novel ever. If you haven't read Beloved yet, gift yourself the experience of it because this is truly one of the greatest things that we have. Oh man, we got to the last one already. <laughs> the last book I've read by Morrison is Jazz. I just recently finished this one. The inception of this little book. Morrison knew this photographer who was at a rent party. At this party, this young girl was shot at and everyone was confused and was like, what happened? What's wrong? And her response was, I'll tell you tomorrow. But then it came to light that she had a jilted lover who had shot her with a silencer. And that was sort of the inception or the idea that Jazz was born out of. And I broke a cardinal rule. I broke the first rule of Fight Club. I said that I wouldn't go into Morrison's alone, <laughs> that I would always try to have community with it. But as soon as I started reading it, this had a fantastic opening passage. So it's, that's the, that's the first word. I know that woman. She used to live with a flock of birds on Lennox Ave. Know her husband too. He fell for an 18 year old girl with one of those deep down spooky loves that made him so sad and happy. He shot her just to keep the feeling going. That is an opening sentence if I've ever heard one. And so yeah, this is a book about an affair. It's also a book about the consuming sides of love. What it looks like when the most fundamental pillar of love is missing. It's also looking at the distortions of love, how love can blow and shrink under different pressures. Essentially, we have Joe and Violet, this couple, and Joe has an affair with Dorcas. Joe shoots her dead, and at the funeral, Violet attempts to mutilate the girl. Violet somehow gets a picture of Dorcas and she puts it up on their fireplace. Joe and Violet were both consumed with this love for Dorcas. And so she's sort of putting these loves side by side. And we see the scene where they sort of take shifts in waking up in the middle of the night. They can't sleep in the middle of the night because they are they are consumed by not the actual ghost of this girl, but by the idea of this girl. And Joe wakes up to go look at the picture of someone that he's lost because of him, but someone that he's lost. And Violet also wakes up. She's tangled in a passion as well, but it's a passion of a completely different form. I think just looking at how consuming love can be, she does it really interesting in this novel. She's also looking at the things that we look for when we're young and how things sort of change as we age, how naive we can be and how that naivete sort of leans into passion, but that there are passions throughout your life. They just look different and are brought on by different things. And she also explores the sort of loves that exist within mothering someone. So what happens when a mother abdicates from that and decides to not engage in that? what happens to the child that she's left behind. Also, what is the perspective of the mother? Why can't she do this thing? I was good for the first like 
quarter of it. I was good for the first half. And then it sort of started to shift. Someone had said that there are a bunch of solos in this. And something that I should say is that this is so filled with, again, stunning imagery, but also sound. Like you can hear this book. Yeah. And then it sort of just like started to do something that was very much Morrison and experimental. And I sort of lost my fitting in it, but that's okay. Cause that's what rereading is for. <laughs> so I will be returning to this one because I think what she was exploring was so fascinating in this book. Morrison once said that it is important that there is sound in my books, that you can hear it, that I can hear it. What you hear is what you remember, that oral quality is deliberate. And I think that's true of this book, but it's also true of every single book that I've read by her. And I'm gonna put a little picture. So I found this, which is like her writing plan. And I love to see writers, writerly processes. So I thought this was really cool. And Biggs says that Morrison's first drafts were written in the language of commerce, of daily life. Once the shape was in place, she would rewrite and rewrite and rewrite. She also says that much of her teaching was reminding her students that you do not destroy what you've written by working over it. You discover it rather. What you are writing in the process of rewriting, which I thought is really cool. I still have many Morrisons to go and most require that reread, but it's an adventure and a journey that I am very happy to be on. I'm so delighted that this is a slow moving project, that there is so much of Morrison to continue to study and explore. To encounter Morrison and come up against her in different stages of my life, where I have like different understanding and different wear and a different perspective has been like such a gift. I feel super grateful that she's a hand to hold and I'm also grateful that she makes us work for it. So yeah, those are our notes on Morrison. This was a lot of fun to do. I think the next writer that I'm going to be looking at is Elena Ferrante. I have two more of her books to read before I've gotten through her entire catalog. One of them is a fiction book and one is her nonfiction, Fratumalia. So I'm excited to do that. So yeah, this was fun. If you've read a Morrison, please let me know what your favorite Morrison was. And if you've not read a Morrison, let me know if you are planning to. You better be planning to. <laughs> There's one rule here that we all have to at least have her on our radar. But if you are planning on reading her, what is the book that you are most eager to get to? But I think that's it. <laughs> we'll see each other soon. Bye.